Hi, I'm Michael Couture, and this is The Debate, a show where two panelists debate three topics. It's June 29th, National Camera Day. They help us capture life's best moments and help us post our cooking skills on social media. Now, let's take a look at some of the subjects that we're going to focus on today. When people consume these artificial sweeteners, it's because they're trying to eat less sugar, which is in and of itself carcinogenic. Aspartame advisory, the artificial sweetener, could soon be declared a possible carcinogen. Is it a smart move to change consumers' habits, or given the number of warnings about potential cancer causers, is it apt to be ignored? My first reaction was this is a pile of garbage, so that's probably how I still feel. Work of art or just an eyesore? Mixed reaction to a new public art piece in Ottawa. It's a sculpture resembling roadkill. What do you think of it? And is there value in public money spent on something so subjective? And then? The benefits of some midday shut-eye. A new study shows daytime naps could be good for the brain. Are naps an important part of your daily routine? You don't want to sleep on the two debaters we have for you today. In Sydney, BC, it's Neil Headley. He's the host of this News Button podcast. And in Toronto, Jessica Morehouse, the host of the More Money podcast. How are you both doing? Good. Doing well. Great to see you both. We'll have you sit tight for just a moment while we get everyone up to speed on the first topic of the show. Well, aspartame is one of the world's most common sweeteners, but a leaked report from the World Health Organization indicates the sugar replacement is set to be declared a possible carcinogen next month. Now, it could be a significant move considering aspartame is used in so many products like diet soda, chewing gum, and others. But there is some caution in the medical field. Next time you reach for your favorite diet soda, take a look at the label. It likely contains aspartame. The sugar replacement was approved by the US FDA in 1981 and has been a mainstay in artificially sweetened food ever since. News of the substance being labeled a possible carcinogen next month by the WHO has healthcare professionals preaching caution. I wouldn't worry, to be quite frank with you. Cardiologist Dr. Christopher Labo says the International Agency for Cancer Research at the WHO has a sliding scale when it comes to these types of things. What they are commenting on is what they refer to as the hazard of the product, not the risk. The standard analogy that we use when we try to explain this to people, a bear is hazardous to your health and that if you get into a fight with a bear, the bear is going to win. But the risk of you being attacked by a bear, especially if you live in downtown Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, is actually pretty, pretty low. The International Sweeteners Association didn't sugarcoat its reaction, saying in a statement, the IARC is not a food safety body and their review of aspartame is not scientifically comprehensive and is based heavily on widely discredited research. Meantime, the Canadian Cancer Society also weighed in, saying when something is found to be carcinogenic, it is cause for concern, adding we will continue to monitor the evidence about aspartame and the results of the safety review as it becomes available. Now, this report from the IARC doesn't take into account how much of a product someone can safely consume. And Dr. Labos has another caution. Yeah, I don't know if you remember from a few years back, there were all these headlines, hot dogs are just as bad as cigarettes. That was another IARC report where they classified processed red meat as a carcinogen, which led to all these headlines, which were frankly not really based in reality. As always, we start with our opening arguments. There's Neil, there's Jessica. Jessica, let's start with you. So what do you think about this? Will this change any of the habits that you have for what you consume? For me personally, no, because I feel like there was a huge uh, campaign for like anti-aspartame back in like the early 2000s or the 90s. I remember realizing, oh my gosh, this is bad. And so we stopped buying like diet soda and, and stuff like that. And 
I've kind of maintained that ever since. I'm always very cautious of uh, artificial sweeteners. Um, and, uh, you know, I've always been like, I don't want to get cancer. And if there's something that I can actively do to hopefully reduce the risk, then I'm going to do it. But in, in terms of other people, I mean, you know, sometimes labels don't work and, and these kind of messages, you know, we're just inundated with, you know, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. It feels like everything is going to kill you. But I feel like <laughs> it might be a good reminder for people. I mean, you know, there are so many things I think most people don't realize is in chewing gum. And if you're chewing it every single day, you may not realize what you're actually um, ingesting in your body. Yeah, and, and how much of it maybe goes into your body as well, Neil. Though, what do you think, though? You're more on the sugar train, aren't you? Give me sugar or give me death, my friend. Look, um, <laughs> aspartame to me is, is, I mean, it's what I imagine hell tastes like. Um, you know, like uh, Diet Coke to me has always tasted like despair. Um, you know, the sugar-free gums and all those kind of things, that, that tastes like being a Leaf fan. Like, that's how bad those things to me taste. And so I just, I opt for the sugar. Look, life is too short to eat rice cakes, okay? It's sad that we live in a time when people would rather be skinny than old. And, and, and it's just, it's, you know, you can live until 50 and get cancer from all the artificial junk you're putting into your body, or you can live until 75 with love handles. Oh, I'd rather be hot and 50, so give me the cancer-causing stuff. Like, what is wrong with us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I personally want it all, Neil, but I mean, there again. Uh, but that hate for, for aspartame, wow. Uh, I think there's some people in our control room, and I'm not going to name names, but uh, they may be the producer of this show, uh, Ms. Mm. Keeler. Uh, anyways, okay, um, that is uh, for another day. Let's take a look at our Twitter take and what people on Twitter have been saying about this all day. Would this affect uh, the way that you or what you consume if it is labeled a possible carcinogen? 59.8% say yes, it would. 40 0.2% say, no, it wouldn't. Um, Jessica, we'll go back to you, but at the same time as we do, you know, when you're talking about what it's in and where you can find it, let's take a look at this list that we've put together. The first one I think a lot of people understand already, diet sodas, it's there, it's on the label. Sugar-free gum, there again, that's one of those things that you had mentioned, reduced sugar jams. Sugar-free drink mixes like Crystal Light, reduced sugars syrups, and sugar-free Jello. Um, so when you're shopping then, Jessica, do you go and if it says sugar-free and you're sort of checking the labels, do you try and stay away from it and just say, you know what, I'll take the full sugar? Yeah, I do, actually. And, I, I you know, it's, it was hard at first, but again, this is a habit that I... Uh, have had for a number of years. And if it says sugar-free, some people will be like, oh, that's great. It's less sugar. It's better for you. I know that means there's probably aspartame and a bunch of chemicals in there that are likely going to have some effects on you. Uh, later, I mean, I, not that I'm a nutritionist, but I do know there's a lot of research out there that shows how important it is just to eat whole foods. And we've got, you know, are so far away from that now most of us being raised in families where we had, you know, frozen meals and, and prepackaged mm -hmm. dinners and everything like that. And because I grew up with that and, and I, I get it, you know, busy household and everything like that. I'm very cautious of what kind of ingredients I'll ingest now because I, I just don't want to be a statistic. I don't want to, you know, be 50 and, oh, surprise, you had cancer. And maybe it was, you know, partially my fault because I didn't, you know, heed some of these um, warnings. Yeah, Neil, when we consider what we heard from Dr. Labos in that piece when he said, look, you know what, it being labeled possibly uh, a carcinogen, I mean, it almost seems like there's really a sliding scale here. And even if it is labeled this, that it's not sort of the extreme. And I think one of the best examples is we'll put up these numbers in terms of how much uh, an actual average adult can consume of it and it seemingly be safe. Take a look at this for a second. If you're about a 150-pound uh, adult, um, it's an acceptable intake of about 50 milligrams per uh, kilogram of a person's weight. So that's 18 cans of diet soda if you weigh about 115 pounds. That was uh, a couple of pant sizes ago for me and maybe uh, a couple of decades, Neil, but uh, let's not talk about that if you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> but when you consider the amount that somebody would have to drink for it to possibly be a problem, are we maybe overthinking this and saying, you know what, I don't think anybody is getting that much aspartame in their diet? 
Well, I mean, think about it, though. I mean, you can walk into, what, a 7-Eleven, and you can get the super big gulp, which is like 72 ounces or something. I don't think I have that much blood in my body. I'm not I'm not 100% <laughs> sure on that. I'm not a doctor. But still, I mean, we get big, massive servings of everything now, you know? And while I can't... Um, I can't aspire to what Jessica is talking about, about whole foods and the importance of, you know, getting your fruits and vegetables and all that. Like I'm the guy that walked into McDonald's and I started ordering the chicken Big Mac because I started thinking to myself, how can they take a McChicken sandwich and make it even more unhealthy? Oh, good. Put some Big Mac <laughs> sauce on it. Sign me up. I'm in. Let me have two of those. Like. I would just rather enjoy the experience of having the food rather than being able to taste the chemicals and think to myself, well, at least I'm going to be, you know, 171.2 pounds when I'm done this instead of 171.21 <laughs> pounds, because goodness knows that 0 0.01 pounds is going to make such a difference at the end of the day. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say if you have that chicken Big Mac, it's not just that point. Uh, whatever of a pound, but anyways, that's my personal <laughs> point of view. Um, Jessica, what I wanted to sort of turn to is like there's so many warnings out there of things that can uh, cause cancer. I mean, really, you know, we're carrying around cell phones in our pockets. Are we sort of hypersensitive to this? And are there just too many warnings about everything that, you know, can possibly cause cancer out there? It's hard to say. There are a lot of warnings. And yeah, I remember that, you know, news cycle of hot dogs are bad. I'm like, well, hot dogs are bad for you. We all know that. But I don't think it's so <laughs> bad that we should let our children have them on a barbecue. And, you know, I'm not going to stop, you know, having them at a barbecue. But um, I, I can see where when there's too much information, then you get overwhelmed and then you kind of discount it all, um, which we don't want. But the truth is, there is a lot of data and research that does prove that a lot of these foods are bad. And, and I think sometimes we think of them isolated. No one's drinking 18 cans of soda in a day, but maybe you're having three and then you're having that gum and then you're having some other product mm -hmm. that has it and they all kind of compound. And if you're eating like that every day, I mean, it's entering your body and staying in there. So I think it's, it's important to be cautious and to make better choices and to really understand what is going into your body. Cause I think for too long, we assume that, well, it's on a shelf. I'm sure someone checked it over and it's healthy and safe. That's not the case. You would be surprised what is legal in this country. Yeah, Neil, I've only got about 20 seconds, so last word to you on sort of the oversaturation of information. Look, we put uh, photos on cigarette packages of a person whose mouth is basically indistinguishable from a half a pound of ground beef because it's just so rotted and decayed away. And still, people will go and suck tar and nicotine into their lungs. And it's like, what else do they have to say on the cigarette package? Here, you will have cancer by the time you walk out of the store if you buy these. People would still go smoke. I don't think the aspartame warning is going to change anybody's behavior one bit. Just enjoy your food instead. Yeah. Okay. And just enjoy this conversation. Continue it on our Twitter handle at CTV The Debate. That is where you can continue to vote on this. Also, have some comments, put them down there, make sure that they are respectful, please. Short break for us now. Coming up, roadkill or art? What if it's both? A new piece of public art in Ottawa is getting a lot of attention. Is it worth the money or is that just the price to pay to start a conversation? We'll paint that picture for you next on The Debate. Visual artist Henri Matisse once said, creativity takes courage. And that courage comes in handy when public art goes on display and the comments start to flood in. Case in point, an exhibit called When the Rubber Meets the Road. This appeared this week near an Ottawa bike path and it's driving a lot of reaction. My first reaction was this is a pile of garbage, so that's probably how I still feel. Technically, he's right. These recycled tires in the shape of a crow is called when the rubber hits the road. And it's once again proving beauty really is in the eye of the beholder, especially when it comes to public art. Something strange. <laughs> Something strange, yes, it's like, uh, it's interesting. It's also roadkill, and the artist wants us to think about our interaction with animals. The idea of this piece is to provoke a reaction and uh, road kill and death aren't easy subjects and I think it's a hard thing to do for an artist to get a reaction that runs the entire gauntlet and that's what this piece does. 
There have been instances when public outrage prevented that conversation. A sculpture of a boy holding a melting shark was commentary on the fate of the oceans and human health. But the fate of the sculpture was sealed by comments from Vancouver residents. I mean, you got to look at it and just laugh a bit. And then there was the $4.8 million chandelier installed under a bridge in Vancouver. My first thought was like, it's nice and beautiful, but there's lots of pigeons and lots of seagulls. So like, there's going to be lots of bird poo on it probably eventually. In Calgary, the giant blue ring cost nearly half a million and was called awful by the city's own mayor. Then came Beaufort Towers. The public outcry was so strong, Calgary suspended its public art program for several years. Time for opening arguments and our art critics, uh, we'll call you that just for this round here, Jessica and Neil. Uh, let's start with the crow, Neil. So are you in favor of this thing or, uh, or not really? Look, uh, my experience has been that there are generally two kinds of people who object to art installations. You've got um, elitists who feel like every expression of art has to fall into a specific box that they can predefine and put a label on it, because if they can put a label on it, then it's easier to group it and then dismiss it. Um, and then there are the people who criticize the art installations as something that gets in the way of them binge watching WWE Raw. Um, but now there's a third kind, I think, as well, and we're meeting them, uh, you know, definitely this week. Um, the ones who will complain about everything that brings someone else joy. And Ottawa has a massive surplus of those people. Um, what I <laughs> love about this art installation is that if you take a second, and, and I, I know the point of it is to highlight our interaction with animals, but somebody, I, it was after the fact, after I looked at the first photos of it, and I'm looking at it, what is that made of? And somebody said, oh, it's made out, the entire thing is made out of recycled tires. And then I looked at it in a whole new light. That's genius. Like, that's, you know, mm -hmm. I, I get it's a dead bird, but wow, what a cool, like, it's it better than having burning in a field somewhere and shortening the lifespan of the planet, isn't it? Yeah. Jessica, are we being too judgy <laughs> when it comes to some of these public art exhibitions? I think so. I think most people think that a public art installation is supposed to bring beauty to wherever, you know, the city, the community. And to be fair, there are some amazing things in, in Toronto and Vancouver that I've seen, but that's not what art actually is for. It's su supposed to provoke uh, an emotion, a feeling, or a topic of discussion, which is exactly what this art installation is doing. And, uh, you know, I, I get why some people, you know, it's divisive. Some people think it's pretty interesting. Some people think it's a pile of garbage, which it technically is. And I think that's also really cool. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, I think a lot of people, art makes them uncomfortable. And uh, it's probably because we don't, as a society, value art. And we just don't know what to do with it because it. We don't understand, like, why would this have monetary value? Why is that chandelier millions of dollars? I could make that, da 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 da. Or, you know, that's usually the, the common credit. Mm -hmm. I could make that, or my child could make that. But that's not the point of art. The pro point of art is to, you know, differentiate us from the animal kingdom. So we are different <laughs> and we can, can be creative and thought provoking. So I'm in favor of it. I get why people may not love it, but I think it's pretty great. Yeah, and we've been asking people about it all day on Twitter. Take a look at uh, how people feel about it. And we've been asking specifically about this crow because there's a number of them and we wouldn't, just didn't want to just put all public art into one basket. So are you a fan of this work of art? 65.4% say no, with 34.6% of people say yes. Now, there are a number of art installations, and as you had said, Neil, around the world, around different cities in Canada. Um, as Jessica was saying, I mean, the idea is to start a conversation. People have had a conversation and are talking about this because it is basically everywhere. There are other pieces of art that have not. And even, even as the artist said, to try and break through and to get a reaction, it, it seems like he's won already. It doesn't matter if people like it or not. Yeah, and one of the saddest things that you'll ever hear someone say about a work of art is they'll look at it and they'll go, 
What is that supposed to be? Ah, you know what? Stop talking. We don't have anything else to talk about. Um, uh, you move on. Go look at something else. You know, try and figure out why the Mona Lisa isn't smiling. Whatever. Just go do something else with your time. <laughs> um, you know, I, I look at this and look, he's obviously tried to make a point with it. He, whether, like you said, he has succeeded because the conversation that he was hoping to start has started. Uh, whether it's about his art installation and then, you know, as subject B in that conversation, and somebody says, well, yeah, because he's trying to bring up a point about this. Okay, great. Mission accomplished. People are talking about it. And, and if you don't like it, um, there are plenty of other places in that park for you to look at. There are plenty of other things for you to, you know, you can avert your gaze. You can look at it somewhere else. You could even take the extraordinary step of stopping to read the sign mm -hmm. and trying to get a better understanding <laughs> of what it is about. Go figure. Shocking, Neil. Shocking that you'd want people to A, read while they're outside, but B, to actually get some information off of it. Uh, that, I, I, I mean, what are you even thinking about? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know why we have you on this show t sometimes, Neil. <laughs> Honestly, you try and make sense. I try and reason with you. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, Jessica, you know, when you consider that the conversation is going and that that's what these are for, right? And we are having a conversation about it. But at the same time, as Neil had said, you know, you can avert your gaze. It's supposed to be shocking because it is, mm -hmm. you know, technically roadkill. So, you know, taking that, that extreme step, uh, whether or not it's a good or bad sort of reaction, is that not also sort of the goal here? Yeah, I mean, I feel like if you look at this piece and your initial reaction is like, oh, this is ugly or just makes you feel rage or uncomfortable. I mean, I would suggest digging deep to be like, why is that? Is there some guilt for all of the, you know, miles that you put on your car and all the pollution that you've contributed to the planet and all the times you didn't recycle and all the times that, you know, you were the problem. And I think, you know, people don't want to acknowledge the, the whole point of the piece um, and we should, we need to be uncomfortable so we can, you know, be introspective and see what's really going on. That's the only way that anyone is going to change their minds and change their habits about something. So I think this is really effective. It's absolutely doing it. Um, but whether people will actually take the time to, to do that self work, I mean, that's on them. Yeah, and people have talked about the cost, and we have it here, $14,000 per year as a rental. He's renting it out. Um, let's take a look at some other art installations that we had mentioned a little bit in the story there, but also ones that really have irked people. First, the big blue ring in Calgary. Uh, we have a photo of that. It is called Traveling Light. The budget for it was $471,000. That had a lot of people uh, sort of scratching their head at it. Boy Holding a Shark in Vancouver. That was on the south side of False Creek uh, Seawall. It was at no ta cost to taxpayers because the artists just wanted to make it a rotating exhibit to speak specifically about our relationship um, with the ocean. Uh, Au Grand Dame, in honor of the famous Lachine Rapids in Montreal. That's the next one. This one was widely panned as a bunch of slabs of marble and concrete. <laughs> $680,000. And then the Beaufort Towers, that was just outside of Calgary, a New York artist. He apologized if anyone is offended by it. Um, $500,000. Uh, and many of the Blackfoot people in the area uh, said it looked too similar to traditional uh, burial scaffolds. You know, when you consider some of those, Neil, uh, and I'll try and split the, the last minute or so that I have between the two of you. Those are all um, sort of works of art that get people talking, but also widely panned. You know, is there a balance there? I mean, I think at least for some of those examples that you threw in there, some of the outrage may have been at the cost of it. I mean, you're talking about five hundred thousand dollars, six hundred and something thousand dollars. Um, if it's going to spark that and outrage, you know, OK, maybe that's a different conversation. This one's what is it? Fourteen grand a month uh, as a rental thing. But I think it all comes back to the same point. Um, you know, art is meant to it's challenge a year, 14, your 14 grand a year. 14 grand a year, sorry. Um, yeah. Art's meant to challenge your perceptions and, and get you thinking. And for some people, asking them to think, that in itself is a, an offensive move. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a bridge or a ring too far. Jessica, last word to you. Oh man, that's a steal. That crow is like, that artist should have charged more. That's what I'm thinking. $14,000 yep. a year? These other people are charging 500K? This artist should be charging more. <laughs> 
Yeah, he may be reconsidering that after he sees all those other price tags. Um, okay, uh, we'll continue this debate online. Don't forget, you can continue to vote at CTV The Debate. That is our Twitter handle. We will be coming back to those results at the end of the show during our closing arguments. Short break for us now. Coming up, though, measuring the merits of a midday nap. Does the siesta make you wake up feeling rejuvenate, rejuvenated? Or do you roll out of bed feeling kind of groggy? Don't fall asleep on us just yet. We'll be back in a moment. How many times have you been at the office or at home and thought, I could really use a nap right now? Well, a new study suggests a short sleep could help maintain brain health as we age. There are also indications it could be linked to a lower risk of dementia, and other diseases. Morning, George. Morning, Mr. Wilhelm. Now, as cozy as it sounds, few of us can build a bed under our desk for a midday nap like George Costanza. And that desire to get some extra Z's is a theme for many of us, even if it causes some awkward moments among friends. All right, all right, it was the best nap ever. Uh the benefits of a siesta may be mounting. According to researchers, on average, the difference in brain volume between nappers and non-nappers was equivalent to 2.5 to 6.5 years of aging. While the lead author admits to limitations in the data because it's based on self-reporting of napping habits, a recent study on sleeping habits showed Canadians aren't catching enough Zs. According to narrative research, only 16% of Canadians reported getting a restful sleep every night. 30% feel their ability to sleep is worse now compared to three years ago. Technology absolutely plays a role. I think inflation and concerns about cost of living plays a role. And just the kind of busyness of our lives these days. And that lack of sleep can lead to a number of physical and mental health issues. Almost all your executive functioning, meaning things like decision making, concentration, attention, they're all impacted by sleep. Okay, let's go right to the Twitter take. Do you nap during the day? That's the simple question here. Pretty evenly spit, split, I should say. 50.5% say no. 49.2% of people say yes, they do. Um, I know we've been alternating back and forth, but Jessica, we have a bit of a sleep expert on this. So we're going to let Neil go first. I mean, he's the host of this News Button podcast, after all. Um, well, so, Neil, go ahead. I mean, it's hard to try and summarize 60 episodes of talking to sleep experts from all over the world into <laughs> into an opening statement. But um, I mean, but that's, that's, that's what you got to do. That's how I spent <laughs> the last few years is talking to all these doctors. And and I mean, yeah, the, the science is pretty ironclad. Um, you know, naps are great for your cognitive abilities. And when we talk about cognitive abilities, you know, uh, it's it's the million little decisions that you make every day, including things like, is now a good time to make a lane change on the highway? And when you see the impact mm -hmm. that uh, a lack of sleep has on your ability to effectively make those decisions, it's, it's absolutely stunning. And the science is bulletproof on this. The problem is we live in this hustle culture where much like we're downing aspartame, which probably causes cancer, but hey, we're gonna look good until we're 50 and we don't care. Um, the hustle culture thing has led us to a place where, hey, we don't care if we are shortening the useful lifespan of our brain by 15 years, as long as we can spend an extra couple of hours at the screen kidding ourselves into thinking it's going to make us more successful. And Jessica, I know you're on Team Nap as well, right? Yeah. I mean, who isn't on Team Nap? I love a nap. I don't nap every day, um, but a good like couple days per week. I am lucky that I work for myself and I work from home. It would have been very difficult working my last corporate job. There's no nap center. I feel like nap centers should be a requirement if you still have to go to the office, <laughs> don't you think? Um, but I mean, that's also a, a great thing if you are allowed to work from home, take advantage, take a nap during your lunch break. I mean, for me, I used to always uh, just have a second coffee. And then honestly, if I have two coffees a day, I get really anxious and then I have a harder time falling asleep, which then affects mm -hmm. that sleep. And then I feel worse the next day and it's uh, a terrible pattern to get into. So I just started, you know, just having a coffee in the morning. And when I start to feel kind of, you know, snoozy. 
usually around two or three uh, p.m., but I still have some work to do. That's usually when I just set my timer. I take a 20 minute nap. I think also the length of your nap is really important. I used to not set a timer and just wake up naturally. Then you can sometimes wake up an hour later and that really messes things up. So I only allow myself 20 minutes, wake up, and I honestly feel amazing. With that said, though, I'm trying to get my husband into naps. He always gets really cranky after nap. I don't know if there's any science behind that. He's like, they just don't work for me. I wake up angry. I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. They work for me. Yeah, and I, I kind of feel the same way, Neil. I mean, you know, I don't know if you are able to get a nap during the middle of the day, but I'm one of those people that wakes up feeling even worse. Well, okay, let's, let's establish one or two really quick things right out of the gate. There's a huge difference between having a nap you know, getting to that point in the day where you feel like, you know what, a nap would be good right about now, versus being so tired that you feel like you can't stay awake any longer. That's not a nap. That's giving in to sleep deprivation. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, so these studies that talk about, um, I noticed in the piece that you, you had online, uh, there's a friend of mine that's quoted in there, Michael Grandner, who talks about this idea that, you know, maybe some of the, the, the studies that suggest there might be some dangers inherent to napping, maybe those are people who just have chronic sleep deprivation and they're napping for other reasons than, hey, this is going to mm -hmm. be a good thing for my cognitive ability through the day and it's going to help my lymphatic system later on and help stave off dementia and all these different things. Um, you know, it's funny, there's 7 billion of us on the planet, and the only things we all have in common, we all eat, breathe, go to the bathroom, and sleep, and that's it. And yet sleep, because there's 7 billion of us doing it, I would say that 6.95 billion of us have absolutely no idea what sleep is for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and how much sleep you should get. Um, Jessica, before I go back to you, I'm gonna show you some uh, famous people that are in your company as great nappers, it would seem, in history. Take a look at this list. Albert Einstein, Leonardo da Vinci, John F. Kennedy, Winston Churchill, and yeah, Bill Clinton, even though he probably partaked in a, a little couple of aspartames with those cheeseburgers that he always used to have. Um, <laughs> Jessica, do you think that kind of lineup alone is proof enough that, hey, if it's good enough for Leonardo da Vinci, hey, it's good enough for me? I mean, I guess. <laughs> I guess it does. But <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of benefits. There's probably more benefits than, uh, you know, cons to taking a nap. So I always kind of, you know, tell people, give it a try and see if you feel better. Because, you know, when I, you know, tried to do other things, like just work through it and, and stuff like that. Because honestly, I think there's a lot of, Maybe shame is the wrong word. It's a bit too harsh, but um, because we are in this hustle culture and we value hard work and long hours so much, take you know sleeping in or, or, or going to bed early or taking a nap is kind of thought of as like oh you're lazy. And I'm like for me, it actually makes me more productive and alert and focused, and I'm able to be more creative and make better decisions. But you know, you know if people realize the science behind oh there's lots of great benefits towards uh, you know taking naps. Well, companies would probably have nap rooms everywhere, which I believe they should. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Neil, talk about that a little bit, because, you know, I, I know our European friends, uh, you know, they have a two hour period during the middle of the day where they just go home and either nap or sort of have a meal and sort of value that that time. Do you think nap culture should really be baked into more offices? Oh, of course it should. Um, look, the, the longer I've done this podcast of mine that I've been doing, the more I've learned about how little I knew about sleep uh, and, and how critically important it is to so many things. It really is foundational, but it masquerades as so many other things, like sleep deprivation masquerades as depression, sleep, ma mm -hmm. uh, sleep deprivation mm -hmm. masquerades as a whole pile of other things that, and, and here's a stunner, and I didn't learn this until about six months into doing this podcast, is so doctors go to school, med school for what, four years? The average doctor, your average family doctor in Canada, spends about seven hours in those four years learning about sleep. And most of those seven hours are taken learning about sleep apnea. And so if mm -hmm. you go to your doctor and ask them to help fix your sleep, you might as well ask the person that drywalled your bedroom for all of the actual <laughs> sleep knowledge you're wow. going to get from your family doctor. No offense to family doctors, it's just not something that they specialized on in med school. And when you start talking to people who actually study sleep and specialize in sleep for a living, you start to get this picture of, 
yeah, I have to fix this. And so nap rooms, absolutely. I mean, the last time I worked in an office, though, if we wanted to get a nap in, we would just go and have a meeting with the guy that owned the radio station, and that was just as good as a nap, because we all just... <laughs> <laughs> No, no comment on that, and that's the best way to leave that debate, unfortunately. Neil, okay. Uh, don't forget, we're going to come back to it during our closing arguments, but also coming up after this, one more little mini debate we call our hot take. You'll want to stick around for it. We'll be right back. Get to those closing arguments in just one second. First, though, the Costco crackdown. Those Costco memberships equal revenue and profit for Costco, the retailer. So when that membership gets shared, Costco ends up losing money. The retailer has seen an increase in people sharing membership cards and it wants that to stop. Now, if you're using a self-checkout, expect an employee to ask to see photo ID to confirm the Costco card that you're using is really yours. Let's bring back Jessica and Neil. Jessica, what do you think about this practice, this crackdown that Costco is now going to carry out? Yeah, I mean, I get it. I definitely used to share some Costco cards when I was in my 20s, but I was broke and, you know, any, every dollar counts. But I feel like, yeah, it, we've got to think about the bigger picture. If Costco's losing money. They're going to raise prices to make up for that profit loss. So we got to, you know, we got to just play by the rules. And it is a membership after all, Neil. Mike, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm outraged. I mean, first it was Netflix with the membership sharing. Now it's Costco with the membership sharing. Like, next thing you know, they're going to want us to drive the speed limit. They're going to, the, the CRA <laughs> is going to say we have to be honest on our taxes. Like, how <laughs> dare Costco have rules that they actually expect people to follow? I am outraged. Uh, just as outraged as I am about the crow. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course, Jordan. Neil. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. But his outrage about aspartame is what we talked about in our first debate today. Let's take a look at where that sat in terms of the closing arguments and how people felt about it. Do you think that it'll change the way that you consume um, anything, including aspartame, if it is indeed labeled a possible carcinogen? 60.6% said yes, uh, this will affect what they consume. 39.4% said no. Jessica, your closing argument on that one. Yeah, I agree. I think it's it, better to have the label remind people of uh, some of the potential hazards and dangers of uh, aspartame. So I think it's a good thing. Neil? No one's going to care about the label, I don't think. I think the more important takeaway from all that is eat actual food. And remember, life is too short to eat rice cakes. Yeah. And of course, that uh, public art that Neil was talking about earlier, that was in our second segment. What do you think specifically about that roadkill crow? Um, are you a fan of that work of art? 67.1% said no, they weren't. 32.9% said yes, they were. Neil, at least it got us talking about it, though, right? That was his goal, and if you're outraged and you're talking about your outrage, which of course is a common practice in Ottawa, um, then guess what? He wins. Thanks for helping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jessica, and I don't know about Neil's hate for Ottawa, but I mean, how about the art? <laughs> I liked the art too, and I feel like even people who hated it, hey, you're expressing, there's an emotion happening. So you're doing art right. It's supposed to make you feel something. So it's, it's working. Yeah, definitely working. And hey, how about those nap rooms that Jessica was talking about? Uh, should we have them? Sure, we should. But what about how much you actually nap? Do you take a nap? Let's take a look at what people said about that. We asked them, do you nap during the day? Only 51.2% of people do. 48.8% uh, of people say no, they don't. Neil, your closing argument on that one. Everything I have learned in three or four years of talking to sleep scientists tells me if you're not a good napper, learn Take their word for it, not mine. It will change your life for the better. And Jessica? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. And, you know, if naps work for babies, why wouldn't they work for adults? That seems like sound logic to me. That's true. You know, that there's a <laughs> lot to be learned in that. Jessica Morehouse, she is the host of the More Money podcast. And let's plug Neil's full podcast here, the Snooze Button podcast. He talked about it all show long, guys. Have a listen to it if you want to learn more about it as well. Neil Hadley, thank you both for being on the debate. We appreciate it.